Baraka not only in tongue, Baraka even in their food, in the energy. As we read from the time of Sahaba, and then we look at the life of all of these scholars of Islam, that they eat, they eat little bit. Sahaba Ridwan Allah al-Majma'een, sometimes they ate a date. Just one day a day. And they were able to do so much throughout the day, all of that energy from one day. It's the baraka in the ta'am, in their food. We think baraka only means that if instead of one day, you can have ten. Then there is baraka. Baraka in the wealth means you have hundred dollars and then you become millionaire and then now you are having a lot of baraka. MashaAllah, Allah giving me a lot of baraka. No. If Allah will give you hundred dollars and put baraka in it, all of this will bring so much baraka into your life that within this, through, just through these hundred dollars you will be able to achieve things that others are not able to do with millions. This is barakah. And here we see the barakah in their strength, in their power, in their energy, in their food that they eat. Barakah in their sleep. They sleep a little bit and they get the full energy. They eat a little bit, they're getting full energy. This is all barakah. Where are they getting? The question is, where is all of this barakah coming from? What's the source of it? The source of all of this, their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They establish their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such a strong connection that they really not only knew, they believed that Whatever we need, whatever we have, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I need rest, rest is not just in sleep. That is only a mean that I use because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked me to use it. But I know that rest through the sleep will come only with, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Little sleep with that strength of iman makes them have full energy at the morning, uh, after a few hours. Little food will put so much barakah in it because they know it's not the food, it's the provider of this food. It's the one who's putting all of this energy in this food. Their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how did they establish that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When we look at the life of these Imams. Of course we all can understand that they worked very hard towards their knowledge, towards writing their knowledge, Documenting the knowledge and driving the masail is not easy. Sometimes just looking at one of the rulings may take you days while you're pondering into it, thinking about it, applying it to all different rules that may be coming up. And then at the end you may find, no, there is a hadith that says something else and then trying to see how would this hadith, this hadith apply to this. And it would take days to just come up with one rule. Still, these people, their achievement was such that they docu documented all the main laws of the Sharia of Islam. They had driven these rules from Quran and Hadith and made it so simple for us that you look at their books and if anything new comes up in the world, you will be able to find the answer or at least the rule how to answer it from their books. Again, the question is, how were they able to achieve all of this within that short time? They must have really spent day and night just doing that. Yes, they did not waste any time. They were not running here and there for their own luxuries. But at the same time, this was not the only thing they were doing. They did not forget to establish their connection with the provider of this knowledge. With the one that whom they were trying to serve by teaching others this knowledge. They never considered it my knowledge. They always considered that as the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm trying to educate people about it and I will do the way Allah wants me to do. I will not do the way I would like to do. I would like to get a good name. 
And for that, then I would neglect my salawat, I neglect my ibadah, I neglect the recitation of Quran, I neglect the responsibility towards my family and towards everyone else, I neglect everything, everything else, because I'm trying to do something good according to my understanding. But Allah does not want that. The purpose of the knowledge is to practice it. And if a person who's teaching, he himself does not practice what he's preaching, then what good is that? What, is he, what does he expect from others? Why is he teaching others? What's the purpose of me telling you that there are five times daily prayers, if you don't perform it, you will be punished like this, and if you perform it, you will get this much reward, and God forbid, God forbid, what I ask, I myself missing the prayers. What's the purpose of it then? Why you should do it then? If I really don't think that it should be done at all, I would like to do is you know the same thing that I know, that there are five prayers a day and then if anyone doesn't perform them, he will be punished and me and you are on the same boat that none of, uh, none of us wants to perform that prayer. They were not like that. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, now listen to their connection and how they were establishing the connection. al rabiya who was close students, he, he says, Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah used to recite Quran every day. How much Quran? It's a very important question. How many Jews he used to recite every day with all of this work that he has to do? You will be surprised. I was surprised. And anyone that would hear this, especially looking at what his real field was and how much work he has done in that field, we will surely be surprised to know that Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah each day of his life used to finish one Qur'an. 30 just every day. After Isha, he will start that day and then next day Isha, next Isha won't come in until he had finished 30 just of Qur'an al-Kareem, recited one whole Qur'an. As far as his night, he had divided the night in three parts. In the first part of the night, he used to write, write his books. In the second portion of the night, he used to recite Quran al-Kareem in Salat al-Tahajjud. And the third portion of night, he will have some rest. And then get up before the time of Salat al-Fajr, so that he would perform some more tahajjud, and then he's ready for the work that he that is coming next uh, to teach the students and take the classes for the rest of the day. One of his students tell us that when Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah was on his deathbed, he was not able to move. I went to him. He liked my recitation, so he said to me, that recite to me from ayah number 120 of Surah Al-Imran. Subhanallah, he knows where he stopped. He is not able to recite. So if he is not able to recite, still on that last night of his uh, life in this world, he does not want to miss what he used to recite, if he is not able to recite, at least he would like to listen to that. So he says to his student, I stop at that point, start reciting from their point, or from here on to me. He says to another of his students, that go to a person who was known to be very a great avid, he says, go and ask him to make dua for me, because these are my last moments of my life. This is his concern at that time. When we look at the ibadah of these scholars of Islam, it really makes us wonder that with all of this, where were they getting that time to do the other things? But in reality, to understand the point, we really need to keep it very clear in our mind, they got everything through this. They got everything through this, through their connection that they established with Allah subhanahu. The problem with us is, if we get into knowledge, we are so much into it that we don't want to do no ibadah. The person is missing the sunan, he's missing.